Mormonism is only about 40 years old, but its career has been full of stir and adventure from the beginning, and is likely to remain so to the end. Its adherents have been hunted and hounded from one end of the country to the other, and the result is that for years they have hated all Gentiles indiscriminately and with all their might. Joseph Smith, the finder of the Book of Mormon and founder of the religion, was driven from state to state with his mysterious copper plates and the miraculous stones he read their inscriptions with. Finally, he instituted his church in Ohio, and Brigham Young joined it. The neighbors began to persecute, and apostasy commenced. Brigham, he, Brigham held to the faith and worked hard. He arrested desertion. He did more. He added converts to, in the midst of the trouble. He rose in favor and importance with the brethren. He was made one of the twelve apostles of the church. He shortly fought his way to a higher post and a more powerful president of the twelve. The neighbors rose up and drove the Mormons out of Ohio, and they settled in Missouri. Brigham went with them. The Missourians drove them out, and they retreated to Novo, Illinois. They, pros they prospered there and built a temple which made some pretensions to architectural grace and achieved some celebrity in a section of country where a brick courthouse with a tin dome and a cupola on it was contemplated with reverential awe. But the Mormons were badgered and harried again by their neighbors. All the proclamations Joseph Smith could issue denouncing polygamy and repudiating it as utterly anti-Mormon were of no avail. The people of the neighborhood on both sides of the Mississippi claimed that polygamy was practiced by the Mormons, and not only polygamy, but a little of everything that was bad. Brigham returned from a mission to England, where he had established a Mormon newspaper, and he brought back with him several hundred converts to his preaching. His influence among the brethren augmented with every move he made. Finally, Nauvoo was invaded by the Missouri and Illinois Gentiles, and Joseph Smith killed. A Mormon named Rigdon assumed the presidency of the Mormon church and government in Smith's place, and even tried his hand at a prophecy or two. But a greater than he was at hand. Brigham seized the advantage of the hour, and without other authority than superior brain and nerve and will, hurled Rigdon from his high place and occupied it himself. He did more. He launched an elaborate curse at Rigdon and his disciples, and he pronounced Rigdon's, quote, prophecies, emanations from the devil, and ended by, quote, handing the false prophet over to the buffetings of Satan for a thousand years. Probably the longest term ever inflicted in Illinois. The people were recognized their master. They straightaway elected Brigham Young president by a prodigious majority and have never faltered in their devotion to him from that day to this. Brigham had forecast a quality which no other prominent Mormon has probably ever possessed. He recognized that it was better to move to the wilderness than be moved. By his command, the people gathered together their meager effects, turned their backs upon their homes and their fates toward the wilderness, and on a bitter night in February fled in sorrowful procession across the frozen Mississippi, lighted on their way by the glare from their burning temple whose sacred furniture their own hands had fired. They camped several days afterward on the western verge of Iowa, and poverty, want, hunger, cold, sickness, grief, and persecution did their work, and many succumbed and died, martyrs fair and true, whatever else they might have been. Two years the remnant remained there, while Brigham and a small party crossed the country and founded Great Salt Lake City, purposely choosing a land which was outside the ownership and jurisdiction of the hated American nation. Note that. This was in 1847. Brigham moved his people there and got them settled just in time to see disaster fall again. For the war closed and Mexico ceded Brigham's refuge to the enemy, the United States. 
1849, the Mormons organized a free and independent government and erected the state of Deseret which Brigham, with Brigham Young as its head. But the very next year, Congress deliberately snubbed it and created the Territory of Utah out of the same accumulation of mountains, sagebrush, alkali, and general desolation, but made Brigham governor of it. Then for years, the enormous migration across the plains to California poured through the land of the Mormons, and yet the church remained staunch and true to its lord and master. Neither hunger, thirst, poverty, grief, hatred, contempt, nor persecution could drive the Mormons from their faith or their allegiance. And even the thirst for gold, which gleaned the flower of the youth and strength of many nations, and was not able to entice them. That was the final test. An experiment that could survive that was an experiment with some substance to it somewhere. Great Salt Lake City throve finely, and so did Utah. One of the last things which Brigham Young had done before leaving Iowa was to appear in the pulpit dressed to personate the worshipped and lamented Prophet Smith and confer the prophetic succession with all its dignities, emoluments, and authorities upon President Brigham Young. The people accepted the pious fraud with the maddest enthusiasm, and Brigham's power was sealed and secured for all time. Within five years afterward, he openly added polygamy to the tenets of the church by authority of a, uh, quote, revelation, which he pretended had been received nine years before by Joseph Smith, albeit Joseph is amply on record as denouncing polygamy to the day of his death. Now was Brigham become a second Andrew Johnson in the small beginning and steady progress of his official grandeur. He had served successively as a disciple in the ranks, home missionary, foreign missionary, editor and publisher, apostle, president of the Board of Apostles, president of all Mormondom, civil and ecclesiastical, successor to the great Joseph by the will of heaven, prophet, seer, revelator. There was but one dignity higher which he could aspire to, and he reached out modestly and took that. He proclaimed himself a god. He claims that he is to have a heaven of his own hereafter, and that he will be its god, and his wives and children, its goddesses, princes, and princesses. Into it all faithful Mormons will be admitted with their families and will take rank and consequence according to the number of their wives and children. If a disciple dies before he has time to accumulate enough wives and children to enable him to be respectable in the next world, any friend can marry a few wives and raise a few children for him after he is dead. And, and they are duly credited to his account and his heavenly status advanced accordingly. Let it be borne in mind that the majority of the Mormons have always been ignorant, simple, of an inferior order of intellect, unacquainted with the world and its ways, and let it be borne in mind that the wives of these Mormons are necessarily after the same pattern, and their children likely to be fit representatives of such a conjunction. And then let it be remembered that for 40 years <clears throat> these creatures have been driven, 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 relentlessly, and mobbed, beaten, and shot down, cursed, despised, expatriated, banished to a remote desert, whither they journeyed gaunt with famine and disease, disturbing the ancient solitudes with their laminations, and marking the long way with graves of their dead and all because they were simply trying to live and worship God in the way which they believed, with all their hearts and souls to be the true one. Let all these things be borne in mind, and then it will not be hard to account for the deathless hatred which the Mormons bear our people and our government. That hatred has fed fat its ancient grudge ever since Mormon Utah developed into a self-supporting realm and the church waxed rich and strong. Brigham, as territorial governor, 
made it plain that Mormondom was for the Mormons. The United States tried to rectify all that by appointing territorial officers from New England and other anti-Mormon localities, but Brigham prepared to make their entrance into his dominions difficult. 3,000 United States troops had to go across the plains and put these gentlemen in office, and after they were in office, they were so helpless, they were as helpless as so many stone images. They made laws which nobody minded and which could not be executed. The federal judges opened court in a land filled with crime and violence and sat as holiday spectacles for insolent crowds 